it takes time to figure out, first of all, what do we have enough in common that we can start from a place of trust before diving into difference. But I must tell you that I'm not as um, hung up about the need for patience as uh, maybe what you've suggested. Here's why. Uh, my many years of walking this complicated earth uh, tells me that every single one of us is more than meets the eye. We are, as I say, and don't label me, um, the, only, the only label that I can stand by that captures all of us is the label plural. We are all plurals. And let me bounce this off of you. If we got into the habit, Brett, of entering into potentially contentious conversations, uh, you know, conversations in which we know there's gonna be disagreement, but we started it off by saying, look, we don't know much about each other. We probably only really know that we disagree on X issue. But the one thing that I can count on, I would say to you, Brett, is that you are so much more than what I think I know about you. So am I. I'm so much more than what you assume about me. And can we agree, therefore, that in this conversation, I'm not going to judge you or judge the totality of who you are based on your position uh, on this particular issue. And could you extend to me the same courtesy? If we established an, a ground rule like that, first of all, is that too idealistic? Is that a habit we can actually get into in order to begin uh, making, you know, um, uh, making a conversation more constructive than it might otherwise be? So it's funny. Um, I had almost forgot to mention it. The, uh, there is a small community of people, I don't even know exactly know what its boundaries are, but that was united by our friendship with Mike Brown. Mike Brown used to hold a uh, a gathering he called Science Camp, where he would bring scientists to a particular island, and we would talk to each other about what we thought were true was true, doing exactly the sort of thing you and I are describing here. And there was a thing that we had called Double Island Rule. The Double Island Rule, because we were meeting on Double Island, was that when somebody says something that sounds stupid you know they wouldn't be in the conversation if they were stupid. Therefore, you are obligated to imagine that what they have said makes sense relative to some framework, and you're obligated to look for it, right? Leaping to the conclusion that because somebody has said something preposterous, um, that they are obviously not making sense wouldn't, wouldn't be a reasonable thing to do in that context. Now, you can't apply this rule just any old place, right? Lots of people say lots of stupid stuff. But... In the context where you have uh, curated the discussion so that everybody there knows what sense sounds like, at the point people stop making sense, there's typically a reason for it. And very frequently it comes down to one of these uh, glossary comparisons or something like that. So um, I, I, I love your approach to this, which is, you know, all wise people recognize that you that I might be the central player in my story, but that you are surely the central player in your story. Right. And therefore I need to correct the discussion for the fact that if each participant is having that experience, that, you know, and this is someplace very important to me, we are actually having a conversation that exists between us. The important thing about this conversation is not what happened in your head. That could go on to be important. You could go on to do something with it. Likewise, I could go on to do something with it. But the primary import of this conversation is that you and I have created an emergent space between us in which we have reached an understanding, right? And it contains pieces of what I think and pieces of what you think. And it seems to be hanging together in the middle in the sense that we seem to agree on important things that uh, are enlightening in their own right. And it's very hard, I think, to create 
a desire to do that for people who have too frequently been rewarded for, mm -hmm. uh, let's say, zero-sum competition in mm -hmm. discussion, where typically they feel good if they score points in a discussion uh, or if uh, they get lots of um, kudos for having one-upped somebody. Right. Um, but if your experience is that actually if I, if I just simply have faith that there is an emergent feature to this conversation and I work to enhance the emergent part of the conversation, that it tends to be good for me in ways that I can't even put my finger on, so I don't need to worry about it. Well, and, and I think that it tends to be good uh, in a way that I can, and I think most people, if they think about it this way, would easily be able to put their finger on, which is this. Look, if, if, you, if you want to be heard, whatever your message, the surest way, the most reliable way to get a fair hearing is to give one first. Mm. Not because there's any magic in that, but because there is a, a biological process here where, uh, Brett, if I am asking you sincere questions about where you're coming from, and I'm listening to understand, not to win, because there's no need to turn a perfectly good discussion into a debate. Um, and I continue to ask you authentic questions from a place of curiosity and not judgment. Whatever emotional defenses you may have walked into the conversation with because you knew that we disagreed on something, hence the high emotional defenses, now your emotional defenses can lower. And that in turn means that the clatter and the clutter in your head of wanting to poke holes in whatever argument I'm about to make can at the very least diminish. And you'll have more space to hear where I'm coming from exactly because I've given you the space to be heard. Um, again, I'm not saying that you know, every conversation is going to go swimmingly as a result, but I will tell you, I've, uh, I'm the co-executive producer of a documentary coming out soon about a young woman, uh, one of my mentees uh, from NYU, who um, advocated changing the Mississippi state flag, particularly the Confederate battle emblem in that flag. And, uh, you know, her movement won this longstanding goal just a few months ago. But in the process, she uh, launched an incendiary protest and, of course, uh, received a ton of hate for it. And then she decided she's going to try something different. And she tried exactly what you and I have just described. And she sat down with not just a supporter of the Confederate flag, but somebody who belongs to the Sons of Confederate Veterans, OK? And she started by asking him a genuine question, heartfelt. How does that flag make you feel? So not a brain buster, uh, not gotcha. Just how does it make you feel? And he replied, makes me feel at home. He asked her, how does it make you feel? Mm. And she said, like I'm not at home, <laughs> even though I am. And the conversation got underway in earnest. And during that time, uh, the flag supporter, uh, Lewis is his name, realized something. He realized that he actually cared more about Genesis than he did about the flag itself. And afterwards, I asked him, what the hell, man? Like, how did that happen? And he said, honestly, uh, I've just never experienced respect from anybody on the other side, uh. like I did today. It, it is... It is that it is that simple, not saying that it's easy to show respect to somebody with whom you profoundly disagree on something that you're passionate about. But when you do offer it, it's amazing what can happen. 
And for those who assume, I have nothing to say to somebody who must obviously be a racist. Let me tell you, not in that conversation, not after that conversation, but about 10 months later, Lewis, through his own volition, pulled down the Confederate flag that was flying in his backyard, neatly folded it up and put it in a box called things of the past. And between that conversation and that moment, he not only joined the new flag movement, <laughs> but this is so beautifully, deliciously Mississippi, he became a mentor to the leaders of the movement, teaching them how to protect themselves with guns, how to work a gun, how to clean a gun, how to maintain it, how to get it registered. He was their guru. And let me tell you, that gave them the peace of mind to go boldly forth. That is a beautiful story. It is a really beautiful story. And it resonates for so many different reasons. Um, and the Confederate flag is the perfect thing to be at the heart of that story because anybody who has um, engaged Southerners who favor that flag knows that it is not simply and in, in general is not even flown by people proudly as an assertion of uh, racial dominance. That's right. It is flown as a symbol of Southern identity for certain people, yeah. right? Heritage. Heritage. Now, those of us who, you know, from the North or Black or whatever, rightly understand that flag as a threat, right, to something important. And so you can just see how the conversation uh, bogs down in the assumption of what the other must be thinking. And, and, and the key word there, assumption. Right, the assumption. Right. And so the other thing that I would say is I have not lived that story over the Confederate flag, but I have lived many analogs of this story where there is somebody I'm not supposed to be able to talk to and something in me that I think others would regard as perverse finds that challenge irresistible, right? I love to talk to such people. And when I do, it's not every time, but it's certainly the majority of times. It is readily possible to cross that bridge. It is frequently delightful what you find on the other side. It's not typically enlightened. They may not feel that I am enlightened. But the discovery of the humanity on the other side of a bridge that's supposed to be uncrossable is so rewarding, mm -hmm. right? It is so reifying of the sense of humanity and possibility and optimism and all of those things that I swear to you, it's addictive. And I'm, I know I'm talking to somebody who must feel that same thing. I do. And if only, you know, I, I've said it in various ways. I've said that uh, doing away with your own bigotry is like giving yourself a huge raise. Right, You don't know what cost you're paying walking around the world with bigotry. It's, right. it's costing you every hour of every day in ways you don't have any idea about until you get rid of it. And when you get rid of it, you'll discover people are more interesting, they're more fun, they're more surprising, and uh, you know, it, it really is like some giant rays that just makes you freer than you were before. If Life becomes an adventure. It does. Yeah. And and if people understood that, like, you know, if you could give yourself a, a raise, a monetary raise, would you do it? Of course you would, right? If you could give yourself a raise that just didn't happen to pay in money, but it paid in something else that's more valuable, would you do that? Of course you would. Well, here's one, you know, to the extent that you have bigotry, right? Just cancel it. Just try it out. Try it out for a week, right? Yeah. See if you're not a happier person. See if you don't feel smarter, frankly. Right, because these biases they don't help you think clearly, right? It's that, so true. They're 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 about. In some fact, they battle. prevent you from thinking. <laughs> right, that or, is, you know, from actually thinking. That is exactly exactly right. That's a lovely story. What is the name of the documentary? It's called Mississippi Turning. Oh, good one. <laughs>
And, you know, some people may think that as a result of the new flag and all that, it implies that, uh, you know, Mississippi is turning as in spoiling, right? And other people will see Mississippi, Mississippi turning for the better. So either way, we've got ourselves covered. Love it. It's a, it's a deep play on words. Um, and the, uh, did I glean that the, the protagonist uh, or one of the protagonists of your story, her name was Genesis? Genesis, yes. Genesis. Yep. All right. Well, that's interesting, too. Um, yeah. Okay. That's that's fantastic. I look forward to this this documentary. Um, it uh, maybe it will succeed in making the point to many about what might be on the other side, and we can stop this nonsense of accusing people of being deplorable or right. uh, whatever it is that people somehow imagine. It's hard to once you stop doing that. It's hard to even understand what is in people's minds about it. 